So um, I should perhaps uh, say a bit of what got me into self-compassion in the first place. Um, so I first learned mindfulness meditation in uh, Sri Lanka back in 1977. I never became a monk like Sean, but uh, I did. <laughs> I did eat a lot of amazing meals with the monks as we went from one house to another, and and really, I think learned in a really lovely setting, you know, something about mindfulness. Needless to say, every day you we learn more, so it just kind of got me started. Then after that, I went to graduate school and. In graduate school, I wrote a dissertation on anxiety disorders. I also had special training in anxiety disorders. I graduated in 84. And then for the next 20 years, in spite of all of that, I suffered from a debilitating anxiety disorder, which was public speaking anxiety. And... Um, and once it got so bad that I was giving a talk to about 75 therapists in Santa Fe and I couldn't speak, you know, I was literally, I got up to speak and nothing came out of my mouth. You know? <laughs> Somebody in the back of the room yells out, take a breath. <laughs> so it was very humiliating, to say the least. Um, but nothing I did helped. In other words, trying to make room for the experience and meditating and also trying, you know, beta blockers and all the everything in the toolbox of therapists for public speaking exposure. I, I took every opportunity I had to speak. Nothing helped until I learned loving kindness meditation. So I was at a retreat at the Insight Meditation Society, and I was fulminating about a conference that was coming up at Harvard Medical School, which I had actually co-organized, I did expose myself as much as I could. And uh, then I had an interview with um, Sharon Salzberg, and I didn't tell her precisely what was going on in my mind, but she kind of intuited, and she more or less said, Chris, why don't you just sit on your cushion and love yourself? <laughs> in other words, you know, whatever you're worrying about, just love yourself. And, and so I, I thought, you know, why not? <laughs> Nothing else works. You know, my mind was, I was, this was like halfway through the retreat, not mindful at all. But I started to, you know, say, oh, may I be safe? May I be peaceful? May I be healthy? Like that. And very quickly, I became happy. Very quickly with the rising of the warmth and the happiness, my mind cleared. I could see you know, I was more perceptive about what was going on inside and outside. So I thought, wow, this, this, there's something here. So uh, from the next morning onward, every morning I practice loving kindness meditation, but, but only for myself, you know. And then four months later, oh, and I should say, often I thought about this horrifying conference coming up, the first of our now 12 conferences on meditation and psychotherapy at, at Harvard, Harvard Medical School. And whenever I thought about it, I just loved myself. I just said, oh, may you be safe, may you be peaceful. I had actually given up trying to not be a mess, not be panic stricken, not be broken. I gave it up. I just loved myself because I was broken, because I was handicapped in this way. I just loved myself over and over. And then when this conference finally came up, and I got up to speak, there was a new voice in the back of my head that was saying, oh, may you be safe, may you be peaceful, may you be healthy. And then I looked out over the crowd and I felt so much love for the crowd. And I can tell you, this is the first crowd I ever felt love for. Because if you have public speaking anxiety, basically the audience is the enemy because they can pass judgment on you. So my first lesson was, Self-compassion instantly, when you're in a state of self-compassion, it's a it's usually an omnidirectional state that includes others. So quickly 
kindness for myself became kindness for others. This was quite surprising to me. The other thing that I learned at that time was that <clears throat> self, that public speaking anxiety is actually not an anxiety disorder. I'd been trying to make room for anxiety, for trembling and all this stuff, but I couldn't do it. And the reason I couldn't do it is because it wasn't the problem. The problem was shame. In other words, I wasn't even aware that I had a shame disorder. And at the time, psychologists weren't talking about public speaking anxiety as a shame disorder. So I actually was not making room for shame. But even if I knew it was a shame disorder, I probably could not have made room for shame. And the reason for that is that shame is a, as Carl Jung says, a, a soul eating emotion. It goes, it goes straight to the core of who we are. Shame is, is like a, is a, is a condemnation of the self. And when the sense of self is so shaky like that, there's no one home to make room for your experience. You, you're just not there. You know, it's like, it's, it's kind of like panic when somebody's in a panic state, it's almost impossible to be aware of. It's impossible to hold your experience of panic when you are in a state of panic. So this is what I, the main thing I learned, and this is what got me on the path to self-compassion is that uh, sometimes we we need to hold ourselves as people. In other words, the sentient being, the, the self as as arbitrary and delusional as it is, we are living in this relative world and that in the level of relativity, we must sometimes just hold ourselves before we can hold our experience. This to me was a revelation. And especially when we're caught in the grip of intense and disturbing emotions like shame or terror, it's really, really hard to be mindful of shame or terror other than to say, this is shame, this is terror, but it's gotcha. So I found that the most effective way to actually move toward mindfulness in a situation like that was to hold myself as a broken, wounded, overwhelmed human being tenderly with a great deal of love. And then lo and behold, everything started to change. So that was my doorway to um, self-compassion.